Hi everyone, my name is Becky Robinson and I am so thrilled to have another conversation today with Ralph Brandt of RDR Group. Welcome, Ralph. Hey, Becky. It's good to be here. It's, it's really great to talk with you again. Um, those of you who have attended other webinars might have had the chance to learn from Ralph um, not long ago when we did uh, a webinar about diversity and inclusion and then again with Ralph's brother and you might get them confused and we had a great uh, webinar about resilience. So I'm really looking forward to diving into today's topic on dealing with incivility and promoting respect in the workplace. Um, and as you're joining us, I want to uh, Give you a few technical um, orientation items. The first is that we want to use chat throughout today's broadcast. So I hope you'll take a moment to locate the webinar chat and I hope that you'll use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees. And I hope you'll say hello and let us know where you're calling in from. So if you can take a moment to find the webinar chat to use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees and then say hello. Um, and if you happen to be calling in today as part of a workplace learning or training, uh, go ahead and tell us the name of the organization from which you're calling. Looks like we have some folks from State Farm. So welcome to you um, at State Farm and hello and hello Aloha in Hawaii and Philadelphia and Chicago and Toronto and Ottawa. Um, thanks to those of you uh, who are letting us know where you're calling in from. If you've just joined, a reminder to please use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. Um, and hello to the folks at Lockheed Martin and the folks at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College and from uh, the Netherlands Hypertherm and from Solutions ITW in Greenville, South Carolina, RMD Engineering in Saskatch uh, Saskatoon. Sorry about that. I'm going so fast. And um, to Cindy at Swedish American Health System in Rockford, Illinois, Spruce Grove Public Library. Wow, we have a lot of corporate folks today. Um, and someone from the University of Arizona. So welcome to all of you. Um, I hope today's event is very valuable to you. In the event that it is, we will be recording today's session. So you'll have this available that you can send to colleagues or others who might benefit from the content. I think we may still be a couple of minutes before the hour, so thanks for being on time. So just a rundown again of some technical considerations. We will be using both the chat and our poll technology throughout today's call, so we'll welcome you to communicate with us. Uh, we would love to have um, any kind of questions, comments, feedback throughout the event, you know, in the event that Ralph, um, you know, says something you agree with or he might say something you disagree with. We want to hear all of it and be able to have the chance to engage with you on all those topics. Um, and we will also be sending a PDF of some slides with our follow-up material for your continued learning. So um, thanks so much and glad to have you. We're going to dive in in just a few moments. Ralph, before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to introduce you. Uh, Ralph, um, is one of the principals of RDR Group, and he and RDR Group deliver training on a wide range of topics to clients like State Farm and um, Notre Dame, and name some more for me. <laughs> oh, we wor we've worked with Cisco Systems, we work with uh, Yale University, the Department of Energy, um, quite a wide range. Uh, Ralph and his brother Rich, who's his twin brother, the Brandt brothers, we like to call them, uh, do an incredible job of pouring into organizations to help create cultures where people can improve their connections. And I, I'm just so thrilled to continue to learn with you today, Ralph. Thanks, Becky. Sure. So uh, let's dive in. Um, I'm imagining that a lot of people on this webinar have dealt with incivility in various forms. And I think the moment I say incivility, people know what that means. You know, we've had that uh, someone be rude to us or dealt with challenging relationships. Um, but just let's start at the beginning and define the term so that we're all on the same page as we begin today. Sure, I think that's a great idea, Becky. I, you know, because we work with so many different clients who have so many different needs around this topic, um, I feel it's best to think of incivility as a range of behavior from mildly annoying to openly hostile, um, which can get confusing, 
but it includes everything from somebody looking on their cell phone when they're you're talking to them to somebody who harasses you and even somebody who assaults you because it's all uncivil uncivilized however you want to think about it uh, but technically um, we define incivility as and this will be the next slide incivility is anything perceived as offensive or inappropriate and of course the operative word there is perceived and this is where problems arise because what i think of as offensive you may think is harmless and um this is where the whole idea of respect comes in because um respect has to do with honoring how other people feel it's about being courteous and thoughtful on behalf of others. And um, here's our definition of respect. It really kind of follows what I just said. It's, it's honoring other people's feelings. So you care about the sensitivities of your customer, your coworker, your spouse, your child, because their sensitivities may be very different. In fact, they probably are very different than yours. And that's what we mean when we say someone's considerate. You know, and um, and so I think these two things are really important to understand mm -hmm. that incivility is a perception and respect is the willingness to entertain other people's perceptions in the way we treat them. Well, that's interesting. I think that as I hear you say that it it becomes so important to be sensitive to understanding what people's perceptions and preferences are, which isn't necessarily always easy, right? Um, so let's um, let's stay with this. So if it's really true that our per perceptions of what's offensive are very different, um, and you're saying if we're going to be respectful of others, we really need to give consideration to how the other person feels. Um, is it possible that you can go too far with that? Like, shouldn't people just like grow up, lighten up, you know? Go with yeah, the flow. Well, like, we were speaking about this before the, the, the webinar. We all have um, different feelings about incivility. Some are more sensitive than others. But uh, the point that I was making is that you're willing to consider other people. So you don't have to let them dictate your every move. But in most cases, particularly in a work setting, it, it's really smart to worry about other people's comfort. You know, how does your customer feel? How do your coworkers feel? Because the research suggests that making other people feel comfortable has a lot to do with engagement, customer loyalty. Um, but I think a lot of folks really just don't care what other people think sometimes. And um, that's really the problem. I, if, if respect is about somebody else's perception, then we just need to give other people's perspective consideration. That just seems wise. That makes sense. So um, I mentioned at the start of the call that our last webinar together was on the topic of diversity, and that's one of your key areas of expertise as an organization. So uh, is this a place where diversity begins to factor in with, you know, our per perceptions of civility and respect? Yeah, totally. Um, what one culture perceives as rude, another might consider normal. I think if you think about age groups and how different they see things, religious groups, uh, gender, there are cultures where people speak very forcefully, others where people are very reserved. And we might think it's rude when people are forceful. Uh, we might think it's rude when people are quiet, but this is just how they're wired, you know? Um, there's cultures where eye contact is important. There's other uh, cultures where if you look someone directly in the eye, it's an insult. And, and again, this has to do with being considerate of what other people might prefer. In fact, a good example around civility and this whole topic is how we perceive harassment. And I really wanted to involve the audience with this because, uh, and I could be completely wrong, but the data would suggest that there's fair consistency that women perceive harassment very different than men do. And I thought we could kind of test the audience to see if our perceptions around this really are different based on gender. And I think even age and culture would be a, a factor too. But let's just think about gender for a second. So here's what I'd like to do, okay? I'd, I'd like to ask the men that are on the webinar and only the men 
to um, respond to the following question. And um, please answer honestly, and, and I'd like all the men to answer this, okay? Would you be uncomfortable if someone at work of the opposite sex you didn't know said, hey, you look great in that outfit? So just on, all the men, only the men, answer honestly, would that make you uncomfortable? Um, and we're, we're starting to get some responses, so we'll, um, we'll give you a few more seconds. I don't know what the percentage of men versus women are that are on the call, um, but again, we're looking for men to answer. Don't worry, ladies, you will have a chance to answer. Um, and some people, if, if for some reason you're not able to see the poll, you can go ahead and put your, your answer. And uh, Donna is asking the question, can she get a copy of the slides? We will be creating a PDF from the slides and sharing those with you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. We've had a, a, a large number of respondents. Great. Okay. So now let's just find out from the women. Um, same question, but um, I want you to, to think if someone... Would you be uncomfortable if someone at work of the opposite sex that you didn't know said, hey, you look great in that outfit? And we're going to take a look at the results when we get to the end. So um, thanks to the women who are beginning to answer. We'll give you a few more seconds on that question. Um, and there's some comments, et cetera. Uh, while we're giving some more time on this poll question, Ralph, there's a question here um, related to this idea that we need to be awake to other people's perceptions of what's respectful or not. And the question is, does this mean I have to study the person I'm communicating to his or her culture, religious beliefs, in order to know what is offensive or not? Yeah, I, and a, a quick answer to that is it certainly wouldn't hurt. The more you know about people, the easier it is. But I think we talked about this last time in the diversity world. We talk about something called mirroring and sort of taking your cues from how people are acting. So if they talk louder, you might talk louder. If they talk quieter, you might talk quieter. Um, if they reach to hug you and you're okay with that, you can hug. If, if they give you signals that they don't want to do that, you know, you, you kind of do what's called mirroring. But we'll talk more about that. Sure, and I'm gonna go ahead and share the results from the men first. All right. We have 82% of the men who say they would not be uncomfortable with a compliment like this. Do you wanna see the results from? I do, yeah, 82% are not uncomfortable with that comment. I think we're gonna mm -hmm. be surprised with women, how they view it, so. Yeah, you know, these results were a little bit surprising to me um, from the women. We have 53% of women who would be uncomfortable, 47% who say they would not. And what I'm seeing in the chat is, you know, people say tone of voice and body language, you know, make a difference to whether or not they're going to be offended. Um, Carolyn says it also depends on how Man, this is moving so fast. Um, it depends on how it is stated and where they're looking when they say it. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And so, so I realized that I gave them very limited choices here and I tried to do my best inflection of, hey, you look good in that outfit to make it sound like, you know, they're, they're making a comment about how you look. But, but here's what I'd like to point out, Becky. 30% mm -hmm. difference in how women feel about that versus men. 82% of men said that would not bother them. Um, only 53% of women said that. So that's a difference of 30%, a significant difference. And that's consistent with all the data that when we're talking about being offended, how women see things um, is very different than how men see things. In fact, I tell folks that if you did research on people looking at a cell phone during a meeting, Young people are less offended by that than older people are because they're more used to it, right? If, if you talk to a person of color about taking a knee at a ball game, they're gonna feel very different about that than a person who's white. So our sensitivities are very much shaped by our differences and that's why this respect idea is giving consideration to how other people feel because we don't all feel the same way. So that makes sense. And um, so as we keep going, you know, what, what if your opinion is different? 
on well, something. Yeah. And in this political climate right now, let's just be honest, put, people have pretty strong opinions and we don't want to just like not say anything. To me, it's about saying it respectfully. Okay. So you can still have an opinion, but the way you say things um, has to be respectful. And I, unfortunately, I just think there's a lot of people who don't care anymore. The gloves are kind of off and it's just creating a lot of tension. So I think that we have another poll question, but uh, first we're going to talk about, you know, do, do you think that that our society is getting worse? Do you feel like incivility is any worse in 2020 than it was, say, in the 1990s? Yeah. We, and I was even thinking in, in terms of a wider uh, historical perspective on that. And I've got an answer, but I, I really wanted to get people's perceptions on this because I just think it's an opportunity with so many people on the call to get their thoughts. So let's go ahead and ask the poll question. Um, and the poll question is, do you think people are any less polite today than they were in previous generations? And I know people are going to want to give qualified answers, but I'd like them to just answer yes or no. If you had to compare the level of politeness today, do you think people are any less polite today than they were in previous generations? Sure, and I'm just going to flag, uh, Ralph, that we have a comment here from Judith saying that, you know, even the questions that you just asked about male and female differences are somewhat problematic in our current society because of changes with attitudes toward gender assignment and identification. So just wanting to acknowledge, yes, we yes. understand there are some people who wouldn't even be comfortable with those categories that we delineated right. in the last poll. Absolutely. In fact, I, I, I could have brought that in as well because there's so many ways to splice this. So thanks for bringing that up. Again, it's just a reminder of our need to be sensitive to the very different perspectives we all have. Um, one comment I'm seeing as people answer the poll, Ralph, is that social media contributes to being, people being less polite today mm -hmm. um, than they were in previous generations. So I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and show the results. All right. Looks like about three fourths of the people who responded to the poll feel that people are less polite today than in previous generations. Okay, that's what I expected. I mean, I expected most people to feel that the level of politeness really has changed. Um, and, and I actually think that's true. I'm gonna agree with the audience, but I wasn't being fair because I sort of forced a yes or no answer on them. In reality, um, even though the data would suggest that people are less civil, and we'll look at that briefly, there are some ways, and I'm sure some of you were thinking about this, there are some ways that people were a lot less considerate in the old days, especially in the workplace. Um, this might surprise some listeners, but, um, and, I'm, and it might even surprise you, Becky, but child labor was normal in the United States until the 1950s. So, People as young as 11 or 12, children, were, were in brutal conditions. Child labor laws really weren't even considered until the mid-1900s, which isn't that long ago. Um, and, and I tell people it wasn't uncommon for men at work to call women honey or to harass them regularly. It was just how people were until after the Anita Hill trial, which was in 1991. I mean, that's... That's pretty recently. And I think if you look at things like police brutality, the treatment of minorities, the treatment of gays, the treatment of people with disabilities, there's no question things were worse in the past. However, okay, um, when we're talking about basic politeness and manners, I think it's fair to say that things have really declined in recent years. And yeah, social media has got something to do with that. But I think society at large is sort of suffering from some incivility. Well, and I know you have some data about this, and I'm so curious to look at it. Yeah, let's, let's look at what some of the research is telling us, okay? So um, these are just some overall stats on incivility. The first one um, is uh, research that says that 84% of Americans, you're going to have to click the, the slide one more time, 84% uh, of Americans 
feel like they experience incivility an average of 17 times a week. I mean, that's an incredibly high, in my opinion, uh, number of times in a week that people feel they're experiencing incivility. Here's another interesting statistic. It's kind of frightening if you have teenagers. Road rage is up 51% in the last 10 years and aggressive driving now accounts for two thirds of all traffic deaths, twice as many as alcohol. So that was news to me. Internet sites based on intolerance, hate and violence have increased 300% in the last decade. So when people tell me, you know, things are getting better, the research would suggest the opposite is true when it comes to civility. Um, let's look at the next bullet. 86% of students say they've been bullied and 160,000 kids won't go to school today. Not because they don't wanna to go to school, but because they're afraid to from being bullied, you know? And then the last statistic brings it back to the workplace. The Harvard Business Review in 2018, so just recently, asked 20,000 employees worldwide, you know, what their number one desire was from their boss. And it wasn't, you know, uh, honest feedback or a raise, it was respect, okay? So th that tells us we really have a different scenario today than probably even 10 or 20 years ago. Wow, those are staggering statistics. I think someone was asking for clarification. When you mentioned teenagers related to road rage, you just meant teen, uh, parents being afraid of their teenagers on the road, not that teenagers are the ones doing the road rage, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, anybody who's got, I've got a 16 year old grandson that's getting his license soon. And I was just thinking, you know, in the old days, people might let you cut in or, you know, be patient with you. And that's not the situation anymore. So, you know, based on this data and just experiencing life in the world, it seems that this problem is everywhere and that no one is immune from experiencing disrespect or incivility. Um, so I'm wondering, and I know we have another poll, although I think, um, Kelly, we need you to hit the space bar again because there's something from the slide that didn't show up. One more time. Perfect. <laughs> that, that last one is really key that people in the workplace want respect more than recognition, feedback, or opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we have a new poll, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's response. Um, the question is, have you ever dealt with a person you would describe as uncivil or disrespectful? Is this in the workplace, Ralph, or anywhere? Yeah, um, let's, let's, um, let's say in the workplace. All right, so in the workplace, have you ever dealt with a person you would describe as uncivil or disrespectful? Um, and we're going to select yes if it's yes. I think we wanted to go through these pretty fast. And I see some people in the chat saying yes who maybe don't have access to answer the poll. Um, I let this one go just long enough that we have a couple of no's. Um, yeah. But overwhelmingly, as we might expect, 97% of you have dealt with the person that you would describe as uncivil or disrespectful mm. in the workplace. And I almost wish we could have asked how many have experienced that today. Yeah, well, we could. But you know, it, it, I was thinking that the 3% who haven't experienced probably work alone. But even then, you know, you could probably be disrespectful in your own thoughts sometimes, but I don't know. Most of us, I think, have been exposed to it in some way. Let's go with the next one. Um, okay, so type yes if you've ever had a customer, uh, boss, or colleague raise their voice, swear, or bully you. And I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. Um, and I hope not today. Right. So have you ever had a customer, boss, or colleague raise their voice, swear, or bully you? I had a job in college, Ralph, where the owner of the business that I worked for swore at me so much that I quit. I just mm -hmm. walked out. I couldn't take yeah. it anymore. I'm wondering if anybody else on the call can feel me on that. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I, I had a boss that was really volatile and, and he could just explode. Um, and, and it scared everyone. And, and he just thought it was his right to, to feel strongly. He was passionate. That's how he saw it. Wow. So I hear uh, from Angela that uh, she testified against the person in court who treated her that way. Wow. Um, some comments of people who have said they've experienced all of these things. Um, wow. There's some really hard stories. 
Yeah, uh, in yeah. The chat. Well, hopefully, we'll be able to get to some of those. Why don't we take a look at the results from this one? How many people? All right, so yeah. almost 90% have had customers, bosses, or colleagues raise their voice, swear, or bully them. Um, and you know, it's something that we do experience probably more often than we'd like. How about the last question now? Yes, I will launch the, the last one and really great comment from Lori that where she comes from, those things are called abuse. Yes. Mm -hmm. So here's the last one. Um, have you witnessed these situations mishandled where as a result they either continued or got worse? An interesting observation from Carolyn that customers think that when they behave badly, it will get them their money back. Sure. Well, there's bosses that think that when they behave badly, it'll get things done too. I mean, and there is, there is something to be said for the fact that when you intimidate people, they do things, but it has other um, ramifications that we're going to talk about too. So and just a note, if you are typing things that you would like everyone to see, make sure you select all panelists and attendees. Some of you are um, only selecting panelists and then your friends that you're trying to say hi to won't be able to see it. Um, will we put the results of the polls into the PDF slides when we send them out? Jason, that's an interesting, interesting request and I think we can find a way to accommodate that. Okay, well, so I'm going to this one. Let's see yep. what this one came up with. Here we go. Okay, 90% have witnessed that these things get mishandled and get worse. And, th and this is what we want to prevent, really, because I think what, what happens is these incidents happen all the time. That's what the statistics say. That's what our participants say. You know, we've all seen it. We've all experienced it. And we've seen it get worse. And, and one of the reasons it gets worse is because these incidents create cortisol spikes. And when cortisol and stress levels get high, we get flustered, um, we get hooked, we become irrational. And sometimes the, even in these political discussions, things start to escalate because instead of us being able to calm the situation and address it, we get pulled in and, and it, companies and leaders don't really know what to do and, and things just get out of hand and hopefully you know, we can give people some suggestions on how to um, deal with it better. Yes, yeah, so, well, everyone who's come here today obviously came because this topic was of interest. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the ideas that you have, Ralph, about um, how to deal with these issues more productively in the workplace. Um, so where would we start if we want to deal with incivility more appropriately? Yeah. So I think it's okay to go to the next slide so people can see what we typically do, all right? We try to give people this perspective that incivility is really a slippery slope, okay? And so what you're looking at on the screen, we try to duplicate with flip charts on a wall. We just paste these different flip charts, four of them with these different categories on them. And we ask participants to give us examples of these types of behavior at work because we want people to realize there's a whole range of behavioral choices that we can make at work. Let me see if I can explain. So on the far left, you'll see the word illegal, and this has to do with things that people do at work. That if they were found out, they'd be against the law. And so people will say things like discrimination or theft or assault. And we have clients in healthcare where there's regulations around confidentiality, so, you know, there's a lot of things that people could do at work that would get them in trouble with the law. The good news is not a lot of people do the illegal stuff. I mean, obviously it's serious when it happens, but the percentages are probably in the five to maybe 10% when things are really bad, okay? But if you look over on the right side of the screen, the far right, we also ask people to list behaviors that are respectful. And they just say simple stuff like people smile. They say hello to you. Um, they thank you. They just try to be nice in the way they interact and such. Um, but then another category on the left side is, is what we call uncivil. So it's not illegal. It's just offensive or inappropriate. And this list is always fascinating. I mean, I, I, I'm almost hesitant to tell you all the stuff that gets put on this list. But sometimes it's just as simple as people gossip. They're mean. They blow up at you. Um, the next place, though, is the one 
we had a difficult time even coming up with a name for it. And we've decided between uncivil and respectful is this category we call meh, okay? Because <laughs> meh is like nothing special, right? They're not being mean, but they're not gonna go out of their way to be nice either. So they don't give you dirty looks, they just don't look at you, right? Um, they, they, they might just uh, send emails that are very short and to the point, they're not gonna put anything kind in it. It's just, you know, they're there, but it's nothing special. And I really feel that this one gets neglected because it helps us to see how movement toward illegal stuff, which is where a lot of companies put all their energy, is, is really a slow process that can be addressed sooner and that maybe we need to put the focus on the positive side of this um, instead of just on the stuff that we don't want people to do. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the range of possibilities with our choices. What stood out to me is when you mentioned um, gossip or backbiting, that really is far away from respect. Right. So if people are experiencing that in the workplace and have distress about it, it's for a reason. Yes. And, and um, interestingly enough, a lot of my clients, Becky, have values. And one of the first values on their list would be respect. Well, if, if we value respect and that's the standard, then it ought to be okay to tell somebody the minute something is meh. Because to say that wasn't respectful and that's the standard ought to be where we start. But instead, what most companies do is they do training only on the illegal stuff, which is so far down the other side of, of the spectrum that, you know, why do we want to wait till people are doing things that damage folks or take us to court? Um, maybe we should help people appreciate there's lots of choices and focus on the positive and address it sooner so it doesn't have so much destruction in the workplace. Well, sure. And I'm seeing a lot of comments from folks that, um, you know, apathy is really painful, indifference is really painful, um, mm -hmm. and that they might rather experience something even more negative. Um, Jeff says that respect is at a high level and needs to be discussed in behavioral terms. So helping people understand, well, what is respect? What does it look like to be respectful? Mm -hmm. um, so thanks to all of you who are engaging. There's so much uh, valuable uh, perspective in the chat. So um, I know that, uh, Ralph, you were mentioning that the trainings that most people experience in organizations only focus on the illegal, which may not be well received and may not really help uplift. Um, so any, any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I think sometimes when, when companies do training on bad behavior at work, no one's looking forward to it because it feels like you're, they're being scolded and um, it's just a lot of negative energy. So when we do harassment training for clients, we call the course Healthy Boundaries, Encouraging Positive Behavior at Work because we want participants to see that high standards are desirable and good and rather than just read people the law, which puts them to sleep. And it's okay if there's any lawyers out there. I have a brother who's a lawyer. This is not directed at anyone. Um, but, but I think even lawyers would say, we need to address these things a lot sooner. And, and if you think about it, if classes and trainings are telling people don't do what's illegal, that's as low a standard as you can get, right? Why don't we start telling people to do things that are respectful? Um, you know, I run a business and I tell the people that work for me and I tell my clients, when you're a business owner, there's really only two types of behavior. There's respectful and everything else. I don't want anybody to be like even meh if they're working for me. You know, we want people to do their best work. So leaders and people in customer service roles ought to understand that courteous, polite, that's what all of us do. And the minute we are off that mark, it's okay to tell somebody. Uh, we don't have to wait until they're doing things that are so inappropriate or Ill illegal that it's, it's uncomfortable to even talk about. So it, it's, you know, from what I've seen in the chat and from this conversation, it seems like we all want respect. Mm -hmm. We all want to be treated with 
uh, courtesy and consideration. So if that's so, then why does it seem like so many of us experience uncivil people at work and in the rest of our lives? Yeah, and I have to say, you know, we're doing a webinar like in 45 minutes to an hour, and literally these courses are sometimes a half a day or a full day. And that is a very, very complex question. Why are people meh? Why are people uncivil? Why are people doing things that are illegal? I mean, to me, that is an incredibly complex question, and I'll do the best that I can, but I think it depends on the offender. Because there's different kinds of offenders when it comes to incivility. So there's a lot of people, and I think all of us would fall in this category at one point or another, that I would call unconsciously uncivil. At least some of the time. We don't do it on purpose. We're just unaware of how people perceive us. We might be busy or distracted. We might be short with our emails or voicemails. We're in a hurry. We might even be in a bad mood. And, and we come across as uncaring. We come across as rude because we're really falling into that mech category. We just aren't putting in any effort to be polite. And I, I just think there's a lot of people, the reason that they're being uncivil is they're just not being conscious of being polite and being nice, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it can be if we're not focused on cultivating positive relationships, it can be easy to be unconsciously uncivil. Um, but, you know, from my experience, you know, I referenced that college job that I ended up quitting. Um, there are plenty of people out there who are intentional with their incivility, or at least in that case, you know, I could have, I, I perceived it to be that way. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, so for sure. Uh, I think that the, the next group of people we could consider are people who are just plain ornery, they enjoy being difficult, um, or they have no impulse control whatsoever, um, no filters. So they blow up at meetings, they disparage other people, they just say whatever they wanna say. Um, and I think some of them know that they're doing it and really just don't care. So those are the consciously uncivil. Um, but even some of those people, I think, will sometimes feel bad that they do this and are capable of changing. But there's a, there's a last category of incivility um, where people have serious social problems. And these are predators. These are narcissists. These are the truly disturbed. And, and those are usually the people that, are, that start moving into the illegal camp. Um, and, and, and so we have quite a few different reasons why people misbehave at work. Yeah, and Don's mentioning even medication-induced illness or induced moods. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that too. So there's a wide variety of characters that we might connect with in the workplace. Um, how do we know what we're dealing with? Yeah, well, so the good news is that the number of people that are really disturbed is very small. So the number of people in the population that I would think are like really serious problems, relatively small. They're not the norm, thankfully, even though they are out there and some of us have worked with these folks. But the bad news is we don't really know what we're dealing with until we're dealing with it. And that's why we have to be careful with people in the workplace, customers, co-workers we don't really know because we're never really sure. So at RDR Group, we have three different trainings depending on the focus. One is geared toward bullying and harassment, which anyone can do. One is geared toward what we call agitated behavior or even violent behavior. And, and that's probably a little bit more of those disturbed people. Um, and then one is just the generic focus on respect, workplaces that want to make the standard politeness and courteousness, but the underlying problem with all of them is incivility. Well, let's talk for a moment, Ralph, about um, how incidents of incivility unfold and what we can do about it. Sure, so there's always stuff that precedes an incident of incivility. You know, kind of the fuel or the tinderbox, you know, and, um, 
people might be not getting a lot of sleep, they might be under a deadline. There's, I think of them as kind of antecedents to the whole process of incivility, but there's usually a, a trigger of some kind. I no, think we have a slide about this, right? No, I, did, I got rid of the slide for the ah, sake of okay. time, so I'm just walking through it. But, okay. Don't they, Becky? Yeah, so usually there's these antecedents and then there's triggers. So a trigger could be, you know, that um, a customer snaps at us or, you know, uh, somebody's late for a meeting and that trigger usually elicits a response. And sometimes if it's an immature response, it can create a counter response from other people that's immature. And then pretty soon things are out of control. All right. Um, I want to talk about how to gain control in the last, you know, 15 minutes or 10 minutes, whatever we have here. And I'm going to recommend three of what I call respectful practices. Because you'll remember when we've talked in the past, at RDR Group, we think that you have to practice this stuff. So we actually ask people to get respect partners after the class and practice these things on a regular basis for a period of time. Um, so we can give people tools and skills in a classroom, but they really have to practice this to make change happen. So here's the first respectful practice. It should be on a slide here. Um, the slide says, practice professionalism. Now, yeah. Yeah, well, so tell me what that looks like. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, professionalism can mean a lot of things, but what we're talking about here is practicing maturity, learning how to deal with the stresses of your job, the stresses of life without becoming uncivil, um, even if others choose not to, you know. Um, if you're a teacher, it's stressful. If you're a gate agent, it's stressful. If you run Weaving Influence, it's stressful. <laughs> and I tell people if you can't manage the stress of your job in a professional, mature way, you're in the wrong job, you know. It, and and People need to learn that, you know, being mature and professional is part of the job, but they have to practice it, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense. Well, do you have any advice about how to practice it? Sure. So it, it's actually a habit, all right? And the next slide kind of shows us what we have to do. This is a, it could be a very confusing slide, but over on the top left of the screen, People have to deal with provocations in life and in work. In fact, a heart uh, specialist did a study and found that the average person has 750,000 provocations in a lifetime. I thought you were going to say right. in a day. No, 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 not a day. About 30 a day. About 30 a day. But a okay. provocation could be, you know, somebody stops real quickly in front of you when you're driving. Um, you know, you spill the milk. You, the 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 copy machine isn't working, it's taking longer to download something. These little provocations, um, they register in what we call the feeling brain. It's the limbic brain, and it's at the base of your head, right above the spine. So all of our um, impulses come through the central nervous system at the base of the spine. And the first stop, unfortunately, is this limbic brain in the back of our head, which they call the feeling brain. And the problem with that is um, if we allow the feeling brain to take over, those provocations will create an emotional response of swearing, hurting someone. Um, it can be very immature. And, and I know you guys have seen some of the YouTube videos. Of, there's one about a motorist that gets pulled over and they go completely ballistic and it looks so immature, it's embarrassing. And we've all been there before where we really pounding on a steering wheel, flipping people off, or having them flip us off in traffic, that's allowing the feeling brain to take over. But here's what the research says, that if we try to control the feeling brain, it's okay to have feelings, but we need to pull those feelings into our thinking brain, which is the frontal lobe. It's the cerebral cortex, right? So human beings are the only creatures that have the ability to act in a mature wise, strategic smart way, but you have to work at it. And, and what's interesting is the more you work at it, that's why it has to be a practice, the more you work at calming yourself, acting responsibly, the stronger the neural pathways get from the feeling brain to the thinking brain. And here's what's really scary. If you allow yourself to go ballistic repeatedly, you actually strengthen the dendrites to that limbic brain and become more and more immature. 
So I don't know if this makes sense, but using the thinking brain is what gets you a mature response. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. We're getting some kind of weird uh, audio, Ralph. You might want to be careful of moving around. I don't know what's um, okay. provoking no, it. Not. Yeah. Um, so I, I love the fact that the more we practice this, the better we can get at it. And it's encouraging to think, you know, if we can become aware of or sensitive to the times that our feeling brain is taking over and stop and then allow our frontal lobes to help us uh, direct our responses, um, we can improve and then, you know, actually get better at it over time. Um, so can you give us some ideas of how we might do this at work? Yeah, um, I actually encourage people to get a practice partner. So we talk about it as a respect partner. So if we're gonna practice being professional, we help remind each other, stay in the thinking brain, you know, let's not allow ourselves to, to become immature here. What's the right thing to do? What's the smart thing to do? So it really just has to become a habit. We try to get people to do it for eight weeks, practice being more and more mature because it actually is enough time to begin developing stronger neural pathway of maturity. Um, so what do we do when, you know, we're working on our own mature response and people are still uncivil toward us or even harassing us? Oh, you know what? Um, I have a feeling we might have moved too far ahead, Becky. So ah. there's, there's one other thing that I want to talk about. Um, no problem. Sorry yeah, about that, no, Ralph. No, no. Um, let's see what the slide, the next slide talks about here. Um, yeah, I always remind people one of the reasons we have to practice professionalism is because agitated people tend to agitate people, right? So if you're immature, and I know you're not, but if, if you started <laughs> acting immature and irrational toward me, you're going to hook me and I'm going to want to be immature and rash, irrational back. And, you know, spouses do this, unfortunately, friends do this, but customers, coworkers, you know, when people are irritated or immature, they tend to agitate other people who agitate back. And that's what we call the next click on the slide. We call that escalation. When you agitate back, now you're going to have a real problem. Okay. The next slide tells, tells us what we need to do if we're practicing professionalism. We need to work at forcing calm on situations because calm people, calm people, right? And this is what we call the next click maturity. Okay. There are people in your life and people in your workplace who calm other people. And this is how we really start to address this whole issue of incivility. Okay. Um, so we really need to force calm. Uh, yeah. So let me go to the second practice. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And that's practicing politeness. And this is where we really work at putting what I call a protective coating on all we do. And if I can say this, Becky, I don't mean to embarrass you in front of people, but you're good at this. Your team is good at this, right? <laughs> um, where you actually make the extra effort to um, make sure that your emails, your communications, um, your interactions with people have a, um, a courteous, thoughtful kind of touch to them, right? And it's extra effort, but when you build rapport, and I know you do this as a business owner, when you build rapport with people, it creates comfortability and um, it tends to lower the tensions and the incivility. They tend to be more polite back. Not always, but I think when you practice politeness, it tends to increase civility too. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I, I was just thinking about my kids when you mentioned the thing about agitated people agitate people because, you know, one kid starts out with a tone that's up here and then the other one just wants to match it. Right, yeah. And it gets out of control. And what, what's needed in those situations, in fact, I hope this is clear, but when, if you're going to intervene when someone gets agitated, don't confront people. Confronting people sends them off, especially if they're violent. What people need is someone to be calming. And, you know, we got a whole course on that. I don't want to get off on it. But, you know, so first we practice professionalism, maturity for ourselves. Then we practice politeness, putting this protective coating on. Um, and the next 
and final practice I'm going to recommend, should be the next slide, I hope, um, is practice promoting propriety, right? Mm. So this has to do with becoming an advocate for respect. Um, and, it, you know, it's two days after Martin Luther King uh, Day, and that's what he did, you know? We have to go beyond ourselves and really become advocates of this. And I think the companies make standing up for what's right way more complicated than it should be. And I, I got I got to laugh at the chat. We've got all kinds of politeness and respect happening in the chat. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as we wrap this up, let me give you a couple of ideas on how um, companies could make it easier for people to promote propriety. Okay, here's the first idea that could help make promoting respect a little bit easier. Okay, number mm -hmm. one, I think we need to be willing to ask people to give us input on whether we're being as respectful as we could be. Hmm. In other words, I shouldn't have to be all nervous to tell you that wasn't respectful. You should want me to tell you. And I know, you know you're the kind of person really, and if, if, if we have the kind of friendship, I hope Becky, if, if either one of us said or did something that we felt was uncomfortable, we'd want the other one to tell us. And our response as normal people would be, oh my gosh, Becky, I would never want you to feel that. So I think we need to invite people leaders especially, mm -hmm. to tell us and give them permission to encourage us toward better behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that seems crazy, but that creates a certain openness that allows people to promote propriety. Um, I also think, and this is may rankle the, the chains of some people that are more in the legal mindset, but when we train people only on the illegal behavior, and we give them the ins and outs of quid pro quo and the hostile work environment, which is, you know, they need to know that. But I tell my participants, you don't have to worry whether something constitutes something illegal or not, because even a court can't decide that. All you need to worry about is whether it made you uncomfortable or made someone else uncomfortable. Because if the standard is respect, then you've got permission to say something um, and to do it respectfully. So let me kind of close this piece and then we'll take questions with how you can say something and how you intervene, okay? We kind of created what we wanted to be a very simple process for intervening when people are being uncivil. And um, we came up with an acronym. The, the next slide should show the acronym. Um, it's NOT. Okay, and we call it not because it's letting people know you're not helpful, you're not respectful, this is not comfortable, it's not considerate, it's not kind, and, and it helps them remember the three steps, okay? And, and here are the three steps for intervening. Number one, the N in not, and if you could just wanna click the slide here, is to note the behavior. When I say note it, I mean don't look the other way, don't cover it up, People like Larry Nasser at uh, Michigan, people like Bill Cosby, people like Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, a lot of people look the other way because they weren't willing to say, no, that's not right. And by the way, we don't have to wait till people are doing that kind of stuff. We should note it when someone isn't really as respectful as they could be in a meeting or in an email. And when I say noted, I just mean, recognize it, start looking for those things. If we wanna create civility, we have to be willing to say, nope, that, that thing there, that behavior isn't quite right, okay? After we note it, the second step is a really hard one. We have to overcome our reluctance to do something. Because the last thing I wanna do is tell a coworker or a boss, or even my kid or my spouse, you know, I'm not sure that this was our best here, okay? That we can, we can do better. Um, but, but we have to kind of work at talking ourselves into doing something. And that's the very last step, is to take action. And taking action to me is not, let's launch a lawsuit, you know, or it's not even reading people a riot act. Taking action might be, um, I'm going to get help from someone else because I don't know how to address this. Taking action might just be pulling someone aside gently and letting them know, hey, what you said in there, probably hurt a few people's feelings, but, but the idea is we do something 
because most people do nothing. In fact, 90% of people see things that they, they know are inappropriate and don't do anything at all. So if nothing else, I hope today's webinar encourages people to have that high standard, to focus on the positive, and to find the courage to, to stand up for respect. Because I think if enough of us do that, you know, maybe we can move the needle in the right direction with civility. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, you know, this is a really helpful paradigm that I want to implement. Um, we want to take some time now to take some of the questions that have been coming in, and there have been lots of questions and lots of comments. Uh, but one of the themes that I've seen again and again is, well, yeah, this might be okay peer to peer, you know, uh, colleague to colleague, but when I'm in a position where my leader is being disrespectful or discourteous, it's much more difficult. I wonder, Ralph, what input you might have for people who are really struggling with, yeah, I, I can do this with my peers, but I don't know, you know, how, how to do this with my leaders. Yeah, absolutely. Clearly, it's a lot harder when we're dealing with somebody who's a power person who won't listen to us, right? I mean, if, if I have a boss who's open to input, and that's why I said leaders need to be the ones that say, give me input. They also have to be willing to receive the input, even if they don't agree with it. It's someone else's perception of how they're acting, right? Um, if you have a boss that is a um, an ego test, insecure, they don't want feedback, it can be extremely difficult, okay? And, um, you know, I, I realize people can't work magic, but this is where you might want to get help. Um, but I also think it has to do with how you say something. So, you know, if you say, you know, listen, I know it's difficult to run a, a team and you've got a lot on your plate, but, you know, it, I think it would just mean a lot to all of us if you would take time to greet us when you come in in the morning. And, you know, you can be rebuffed and, and, you know, and a lot of people are. But you said something, you know, and I just think good people have to be willing to take that risk to hold the banner for respectful behavior. And uh, yeah, there's going to be people who resist. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I think organizations that are serious about respect, they have to, you know, take this into consideration. How do people feel? So we do have a follow up question. And um, someone is wondering if you have any recommendations on what how to have a conversation with someone who isn't willing to receive input. Yeah, well, again, you know, you might have to get some help from other people, someone to kind of arbitrate the conversation. I think you need to put them in a safe place, take them to coffee, um, and compliment them about things that you really appreciate before you give them some input. And you might ask them, you know, is it okay to give you some input? And if they say yes, then the door's open. And, you, and I would give them sound bites. People can handle a lot. You give them too much, they'll be overwhelmed. Just give them one piece of feedback and you know, see how they receive it. Um, that's my recommendation. Sure, well, here's a really insightful comment from Leanne. She says, are you willing to follow someone who is disrespectful? If not, they're just a person in a position of authority, not a leader by definition. We need to stop calling managers leaders. It's not really a title, but a behavior. Totally. I, I tell people leaders are people who influence others positively. So there are managers who are not leaders and there are leaders who are not managers, but we all need to be influencing each other positively. To me, that's a real leader. Yeah. Um, and Jeff says, amen to that last comment. Um, here's uh, some more input. Doug says, I train people to tell a boss, I know you want me to be productive and get a lot of work done, but when you do X, I feel uncomfortable and less productive. Sure, yeah. So a lot of this course material we didn't get to was how much incivility impacts people's focus, their, their innovation. So I totally agree with that comment. Um, well, I wanna once again, thank everyone for their comments and questions and engagement in today's event. Um, we are out of time on questions, but I want to make sure that folks know how to get in touch with Ralph for possible next steps. And Ralph, I know you and I talked about the fact that there are some new laws in effect in various states this year, um, making some of this type of training um, mandatory. So do you right. want to speak to that for a moment? Yeah, I mean, so a, a, a lot of states have basically said we've got a problem, we have to address it. 
Unfortunately, some of this mandatory training is the kind that I talked about earlier, where it's only focused on the illegal stuff. And you know, there's a place for that, but I really think it tends to go down better if we put it in that larger context and encourage people towards positive behavior. So we're helping some clients to do that. Um, and I think it just tends to be way more effective when you inspire people as opposed to kind of scolding them, you know? Sure. So some possible next steps would be to contact Ralph to find out about a free pilot session uh, with RDR Group on training. Um, you can schedule a call or consult with Ralph. You can connect with Ralph on LinkedIn and you can connect with me on LinkedIn also. Um, and you can sign up for our next webinar in the series. I don't know the date or the time or the topic, uh, but we will be in touch to share all of those things with you. We'll be sharing today's slides as a PDF for your continued learning, as well as today's recording. Uh, so thanks for all of you who invested time in this learning together and for the many kind comments that are coming in. Um, Ralph, thank you for investing in this hour with us today. You bet. Thank you, Becky. Thanks everybody for being on the call. Have a great afternoon. Well, you too.